welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It's my pleasure to welcome Vincenzo Villamina. He is founder of OnlineTaxMan.com, and today we're going to talk about tax implications for expats and a whole bunch of other things as well. Vincenzo, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Good, good. And oddly, we're talking about living overseas and so forth, but you're coming to us today from uh, New York, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm based in New York. I do actually you know, keep split time between New York and, and South America, particularly Colombia, Brazil. Argentina, exactly. But but right now I happen to be in in New York. Okay, fantastic. Now one of the one of the show notes I have to ask you, since we're talking about it, we might as well cover this now <laughs> rather than later, is that it says that you recently moved to Medellin, Colombia, uh, last December, and so uh, do you have two homes, or uh, is New York your primary base, or or Medellin? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say I'd say since you have two homes, I mean, I, you know, I to take advantage of uh, of living abroad, both you know, tax-wise, as well as just quality of living and opportunities, et cetera. Right now, yeah, primarily in, in Medellin, although, you know, as you said, I'm in New York now. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, Colombia, there's a lot of opportunity there, both uh, investment-wise and then just amount of expats living there. Um, so, you know, we recently kind of set up shop uh, there to to take advantage of that and all the all the movement, uh, moving and shaking going on, as well as just the large expat community down there. Okay, great, great. Well, so this kind of leads into a good question. So you you mentioned to take advantage of the tax advantages of being an expat, I believe. So are are you technically considered an expat by the IRS, even though you live part of your time in New York? Or uh, is there is there some rule? I'm I'm expecting you to say something like, as long as you spend 181 days out of the country, you're considered an expat, or you know something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there is. A, I am considered an expat, and 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 really the reason is that I have established my residency in Colombia, you know, both in the form of 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 visas and 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 just having a place down there, having a bank account, et cetera. And so I would qualify under what's known as the bona fide residency rule. Bona, okay, um, tell us about that. The bona fide residency rule. Correct, and that that is not um, you know, there's no let's say clear cut um sort of rule. I mean, there's two rules. One is physical presence tests, which really means that you have to be outside the U.S. for 330 days out of a 365 day period. So you can only be in the U.S. for 35 days. Now that's pretty cut and dry as far as timing and there's you know a little more intricacy about that but that's essentially the rule the second rule is is what's known as the bona fide residence test now it, there's no sort of set time as far as being abroad or being in a certain country but you know generally you want to you know, clearly spend more more of your time 
um, abroad than, than in the United States, which of course I do. And then also have, um, you know, other support to show that you're a resident of that country. So again, having a, having a visa, you know, having a, you know, bank account, like utility bills, um, you know, obviously an actual residence, be it a, a rental property or, or a property that you own and, and really spending majority of the time in that, uh, in that country. And that, that essentially would qualify you for what's known as bona fide residence. And then it would allow you to take up to $97,600, which again, that's for 2013. And, and that goes up um, indexed by inflation per year, but it allows you to, to, to earn, you know, this 97,000 number tax-free. Uh, meaning that you do not have to pay income tax on that. So, so you get the ninety-seven thousand dollars or so. You know, we'll just round it off tax-free uh, every year. That's the first ninety-seven thousand. So, if you make five hundred thousand, you're still going to pay taxes on the other four hundred and three thousand in that example, right? Correct. Because the IRS taxes all worldwide income, <laughs> which is right. I, I hear they're the only taxing agency on the planet that actually has the audacity to do that. <laughs> you know, when yeah, when 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 citizens of other countries move out of the country, from what I understand, their taxing authority stops taxing them until they move back. <laughs> right. Is that is that mostly correct? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the IRS for you. So you mentioned there are there are two ways to qualify for the bona fide residency. Is that correct? Well, no, there's, there's two ways to qualify for this foreign earned income exclusion of the 97,000, one being bona fide residency and the other being uh, being physically present outside the United States. Okay. And so the physical presence rule, so if I understand you correctly, you said that the bona fide residency rule is somewhat ambiguous into, you know, there's not like a specific amount of days or, or something like that. But you mentioned utility bills, having a place in that other jurisdiction, having a visa, etc. So on the physical presence rule, is that a certain number of days? I'm looking to quantify this as much as yes, possible. Yes, so that, that is, that is uh, again, 330 days out of a 365 day period. You know, when I say 365 day period, it doesn't have to be a calendar year. So let's say one moves out of the United States, uh, you know, July 1st of, of 2014. You know, if they're out of the States from July 1st, 2014 through July 1st of 2015, you know, then they would qualify for uh, physical presence tests. And, you know, we would have to pro rata the, the, their portion of of days and earnings that they were outside the United States, let's say for tax year 2014. But to your point, it's a lot more kind of cut and dry um, as far as how, uh, how long you have to be outside the United States. So, but that's 330 days, you said, right? Right. Out, out of three, so that's a lot of time. You can only be in the U.S. for 35 days a year. So you don't have to be in the particular jurisdiction where you're claiming residency. You just have to be out of the U.S., is that correct? Uh, right. In, in that, for that, to qualify for that one? Right. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, well, we kind of got off on a bit of a tangent, and I didn't uh, ask you for some background, uh, which I'd like to do now. So when did you found uh, uh, Online Tax Man? So I've, I've, I've been a CPA for, for roughly 12 years. I've, I founded Online Tax Man um, back in 2009 um, with a few partners. I used to work at, at PricewaterhouseCoopers and you know, the big four, et cetera. So that tax, online taxman actually started in, in 2009. And we've been obviously growing and, and serving the, the international community ever since, both U.S. expats, domestic clients with international reporting requirements, you know, investments abroad, et cetera. And then also just non-residents that um, want to do business in the United States. It seems like this is really uh, just a minefield to navigate this, uh, this stuff. The IRS is... Uh... They're making it difficult. The Patriot Act, the Patriot Act is a, a complicated thing to uh, to navigate. It's sort of easy to go afoul of these laws, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the IRS is obviously putting new guidance out there, and 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 there's new compliance requirements for having foreign bank accounts or you know owning up to up to ten percent of um, of foreign companies and. And, and trusts, et cetera. And, and when you couple that with uh, just the very draconian uh, rules and regulations that the IRS has, right, that are, you know, essentially 
you know, the last time any code was really updated and, and revamped was in the 50s. And, you know, that was obviously before the Internet age and before this sort of concept of, of, of you know, digital nomads and people that are uh, working remotely, et cetera. Uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of tons of, of complications and just uh, and interpretations that have to be made off of uh, these laws that are a little bit outdated. Okay, so so can you pick maybe two or three of these laws that, you know, are the, are the biggies that people really need to uh, know about and, and watch out for? Sure. I think the biggest is the fact that if you have, A, if you have a foreign bank account over $10,000 at any point in time, you have to report that. And, you know, that's either a bank account that's a personal account or if you have a business account, um, you know, if you're if you're a signer on a business in which you have financial interests, et cetera, you know, you have to report those bank accounts. Another one is for foreign financial assets. So if you have foreign financial assets, and when I mean that, I mean either mutual funds, pension funds, bank accounts, of course, um, if you have gold and custodial accounts, you know, of course, if you have any other sort of stocks, bonds that are foreign, even if you have land or real estate, but it's being held in a foreign uh, company, um, that's considered a financial asset. And so if you have any of these, and again, it, it really just depends on if you're living in the United States or, or married filing jointly versus a uh, single, because um, the thresholds are a little bit different. But, um, you know, essentially, if you're living in the United States and you're single and you have it and it's over like $100,000, or if you're married and, and you're living abroad and it's over, I think, $400,000. I mean, it, it depends. But if, if you essentially have, let's say, over $100,000 in assets that are foreign, um, and obviously, depending on your living situation, you should, you should be aware of this and, and you have to report these assets on Form 8938. Now, the one thing I hear that has some special treatment, though, when it's uh, foreign, and of course we're talking about Americans here, so Americans living abroad, investing abroad, is the topic of the day. But real estate is, is treated differently, right? Do you not have to report real estate? You don't have to report real estate except if, it's, if the real estate is owned in a foreign corporation. Oh, so, so oh, you, that's interesting. That's an interesting twist. So if you set up a foreign corporation, do you have to report the corp that the corporation exists right um and then yeah and report the real estate as a financial asset so like you know in the united states and also abroad you know people put real estate in in an llc um you know for asset protection purposes and and this and that now um, if you do the same abroad then you'd have to uh you'd have to report that asset okay so you you have to report the asset but if you own it in your personal name you don't is that exactly correct okay so you can own real estate abroad in your personal name, and you don't have to tell the IRS anything about it. But if you set up a, an entity, and I assume when, when you say corporation, you mean an LLC or a corporation, right? right? So you set up an entity of any type to hold the real estate, then you have to report it. Correct. So it behooves you not to set up an entity, oddly. It's sort of counterintuitive. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, it, it really... Uh almost discourages people from, from setting up entities, if you will, or, you know, at least from a reporting requirement. We, we hear a lot about what's known as the IBC, the International Business Corporation. And, and promoters are constantly encouraging people to set these up. Uh, I know that some countries have, I believe Mexico, for example, it has a rule that, you know, if you're going to own a business there or a piece of real estate there, you want to partner with a, with a citizen because then you have some advantages. But, you know, so that's a, a whole other level of complexity. But, what, I, I mean, is it wise to set up the IBC or, or not? Yeah, I mean, I think the IBC could, could definitely be helpful. Um... You know, and it really depends on the facts and circumstances. But I think that, you know, one must be aware of just the reporting requirements. You know, if you have an IBC and, you know, to your point, if there's certain levels um, of reporting really depending on the ownership and your role in the company. So, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you set up an IBC with another American, let's say um, the ownership is 100% U.S., 
then it's known as a controlled foreign corporation. And there are certain rules and, 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 and just more in-depth reporting that's required for an IBC or any foreign company that's considered a controlled foreign corporation versus if a U.S. person owns under the 50% threshold. So, uh, you know, the rules and reporting requirements could be more, uh, could be more stringent. And, and, and obviously, it's one another thing for, for Americans who own foreign corporations to, to look out for because they do tend to vary based on the role and the amount of ownership. Okay, so some other pitfalls and, and things to know about. You know, again, I, I would just say that, you know, one must be really aware of, of the report requirements both for foreign corporations, if you have any ownership, also foreign trusts, and you know, just making sure that, that, that you're crossing your T's, dotting your I's, because, you know, again, if you, if you in a, incorrectly file a, a foreign corp or... or um, or the, the, the FBAR, which is for foreign bank accounts or any of that, um, you could be hit with major fines, you know, up to $10,000 per, per filing, per return, that, that, that might either not have been filed or either incorrectly filed. So it's just really important to either, you know, do your research or engage a professional just to, uh, just to make sure that you're getting this stuff right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So, uh, you know, let's talk about maybe reasons for doing this. I mean, it's, it seems like such a minefield. Is it, is it worth it? You know, you mentioned opportunities in, in Medellin. Uh, what, what are they? Um, well, I mean, I think in, in Medellin in particular, you know, the real estate market is, is definitely growing and there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, expats coming down there, et cetera. So, I yeah, like the real estate market in Maine. Um, what what kind of real estate? I mean, can you uh, um, did did you buy properties there? Yeah, I'm actually currently looking to buy a property there. Okay. Um, what what type of property? Residential or, or yeah, something? residential. You know, they have uh, actually the 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 larger residential properties, right? So the three four bedroom penthouses, I think, actually are really uh, well priced. You know, again, I think just looking abroad, if one wants to. You know, somewhat diversify their 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 investment holdings. You know, someplace like Colombia or Chile um, might be good. Uh, you know, again, if you want to look into Asia, like uh, you know Hong Kong or Singapore or something like that, just to you know hold certain uh, certain assets. I think you know that's probably one of the first uh, concepts that you you learn in in finance class um, is is just diversification, right? So. You know, I think obviously you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, but you want to be able to diversify and 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 have certain uh, pockets of investment around the world. So, so so you know, I would uh, let me play devil's advocate with you for a moment, if I if I may, and and it should be noted a couple of things. Number one, I've been to seventy one countries. I, I'm a big traveler. I'll be in Singapore next month. Uh, I'll be in Philippines, Thailand, and possibly Myanmar, actually, <laughs> if I can get a visa in time. <laughs> and so I'm quite intrigued by this. And uh, I obviously do a show on it, interview lots of guests on the, on the whole topic. But I find that a lot of these countries are really quite primitive. But Belize is a big one that lots of promoters are, are talking about. And I've been to Belize a couple times. And I'm just struck by how, how primitive it is. And you know, corruption's a big problem in a lot of these places, too. Of course, in the U.S., we sort of legalize and institutionalize our corruption, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we have something called lobbyists. <laughs> right, right, yeah. same difference. No, I actually, I, I do agree with you. I think one really has to be careful. I mean, I have had clients that have, you know, set up in, in Belize or St. Kitts and Nevis or, or, or what have you, some of these IBC jurisdictions, and then and they just complain about you know how the banking system is uh you know not up to par and you know that they can't operate and this and that and I, I think you're and you're and, and, and God forbid you you expect a decent Wi-Fi connection <laughs> I mean, right wow exactly. so it's you know you, you have amazing to, it's amazing what we take for granted over here <laughs> yeah very true you know so you have to really be kind of careful of of what you're doing and and what you're trying to accomplish there you know I mean when when people talk about kind of setting up. Um, an offshore company. Generally, I do like uh, the Hong Kong and Singapore's of the world just because, you know, obviously their governments are efficient. They're, they're somewhat less bureaucratic and you do have the, the flexibility of having a good banking system there. 
Yeah, I mean, the, you know, there there are two very modern jurisdictions, and, right? And I right. particularly like that. I've had Jim Rogers on the show a couple of times, and he loves Singapore and <laughs> and, and and China, but obviously different perspectives. Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, it's it's that's the point is you know it, it depends on on uh, on what you're doing, and and if you're you're able to deal with kind of bureaucracy. I mean, if you're going to use one of these jurisdictions for you know daily transactions, then you're right, like a uh, you know, one of the islands or or or, or whatnot is not it's just not going to be good versus you know Hong Kong or Singapore. But if you just want to uh, you know park a certain amount of capital somewhere or, or do something kind of as a long term play, then you know then it then it might be a right fit for you. So, I mean, I think it really just depends on the situation and 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 what the person uh, wants to do, so to speak. Right, right. So, uh, you know, what are uh, let, let's talk about the modern modern jurisdictions for a moment. One of the other interesting interviews I did was with uh, John McAfee, the McAfee security software guru uh, yeah. and founder, and you know he talked about his experience in Belize, which was <laughs> wow. Nothing short of horrifying, <laughs> to sure. say the least. Uh, so it's, it's interesting when we talk about this stuff. But what would someone do in Singapore, for example, or Hong Kong? They would want to open up a, a bank account? I mean, you know, the IRS, or, or not the IRS per se, but the Patriot Act, the U.S. government, makes it so difficult for an American to open a bank account offshore. I mean, uh, it's a huge, you know, we always have sort of thought it's an advantage to be an American, I think. And... And uh, boy, not not if you're trying to open a foreign bank account. <laughs> they don't yeah. want to do business with you. It's like you have a scarlet letter on you. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I mean, you're you're right. I mean, I think it uh it really depends, but it it could be definitely quite tough. You know, some of the banks in Hong Kong, like the HSBCs, and some of the larger banks might be open to it. But I've definitely heard that some other banks aren't. And you know, again, if you're if you want to hold like multiple currencies, I know that. You know, some of those accounts that you hold in Hong Kong dollars, euros, Australian dollars, obviously USD. So, and then again, if you're kind of doing some sort of, um, let's say, virtual business where you have clients around the world and you're running it through a, uh, a Hong Kong company, there, there could be a, you know, some, some tax optimization there. Um, same thing with Singapore. And it, it also just depends on... You know, if you want to do business in China, if you're looking to invest somewhere, et cetera, you know, having those sort of bank accounts obviously is a is a, is, is a help and, and, and could easily help you uh, facilitate certain transactions. You know, I think it's a crapshoot when it comes to being an American. I think you're right. Um, I've seen a lot of times where, where the American passport, you know, really, uh, really doesn't work or, or people kind of shun you or turn you away. Um, and then obviously that always brings the uh, the other question, which is, well, what if I had a second passport? But, uh, you know, at the same time, I mean, it, there's definitely still opportunities and, and, and ways for Americans to, uh, to, to to hold these bank accounts and assets. Of course, you still have to report them and, and file the fact that you, you, you hold them. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a crime in the United States, at least not yet, right? <laughs> and at least not yet, yeah. yeah. To, 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 to hold to, to hold this stuff. So, you know, I would obviously take advantage if if the opportunity presents itself and uh, it, it works for, for you. So what would someone do? How would someone go about opening a bank account in, say, Singapore so that they can, uh, do they need to set up an entity? Do you help them set up the entity? Where, where do you come in? Do you do entity formation? Yeah, so we do entity formation. Uh, we do trust formation. So again, I mean, when, when you look at entities, and generally you do want to have an entity uh, you know, it depends on the banking rules. The, the first thing is you really can't go, uh, you know, open up bank accounts in Singapore or Hong Kong remotely. So you have to actually go physically to the, uh, to the bank and open one up. Yeah, again, we, we do open up uh, entities, et cetera, beforehand. Now, the entities could be, uh, could be opened up beforehand, and, and that could be done remotely. But the actual physically opening a bank account has to be done in person. Okay. So you, you just set up an entity through your firm, for example, and then where would the entity be located? That's not necessarily where the bank account's located, right? Um, not necessarily, but I mean, in the case of uh, like a Singapore or Hong Kong, I would recommend just setting up the entity in, in Singapore or Hong Kong, respectively. Okay, so what do you set up, an LLC or a corporation? A limited company. Okay, a limited company. And how much does it cost to do that? Um, you know, again, depending on the uh, 
the the amount of transactions i mean it, just to set up is around fifteen hundred dollars maybe a little bit more for the entity formation correct and then once you have that entity you can when you're in singapore or hong kong just walk into a bank and open an account or it's not that easy <laughs> No, I mean you, you could you could essentially go to to a bank and open up an account. I mean as long as you have all the documents uh, documentation in place, the formation documents, your passport, uh, et cetera, you could you could walk into you know an HSBC or or a DBS in Singapore and and uh, and open up a bank account. And those banks, I would assume, are pretty stable and secure, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Are the accounts insured uh, like our FDIC, which a whole other discussion would be. Uh, if we start having bank failures in the U.S., the FDIC can in no way afford to pay the claims. <laughs> but uh, right. but that's a that's another show in and of that's itself. Another, right, yeah. Yeah. So I I wouldn't get too impressed with that insurance. I'm I'm just telling the listeners. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They are insured. I, I forget up to what amount. I'd have to look into it, but I know there's a certain level of insurance. And the, uh, what about the asset protection angle? I mean, we haven't really talked about that at all. We talked about diversification, maybe more from an investing perspective. But if you get sued in the United States, can a creditor go to the bank in Singapore and say, hey, you know, pay this judgment? Yeah, I mean, that, that stuff, it, it'll take a, a long time. And, and if, if, if one want, really wants uh, asset protection, you know, my recommendation actually to, 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 to look into setting up a trust, likely in, in Cook Islands. You know, Cook Island really does offer the most, uh, the most asset protection. What kind and of trust is that? What is the type of trust? A foreign grantor trust. A foreign grantor trust? Yes. And yeah. what, what can someone expect to spend to do that? Foreign grantor trusts, um, well, in the Cook Islands, that uh, it depends, but, you know, they, obviously, given the language, you know, the trust and, and um, you know, the type of assets, et cetera, that be put in the trust, you know, you could see it upwards of uh, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, maybe more. And I've heard higher prices than that, by the way. I should just point that out. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean it, that that's kind of the bare minimum. I mean, I would I would say it's probably more in that ten, ten to fifteen thousand dollar range. So you set up the trust, and the trust holds the corporation. Is that how you do it? Uh, yes. Okay. And but you can't just have the trust open the bank account directly. Right. You want to have it done to the corporation. And and the bank in Singapore or Hong Kong will actually open that account for you if as long as you have the corporation, right? Right. Yeah, Correct. Okay. All right. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. Well, what else should we know just as we wrap up here? Um, yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, again, when you, when you look at, at, at trusts and, and, and foreign companies, there, there's definitely some, some advantages as far as asset protection, as far as, you know, potential tax optimization, as far as, uh, you know, state planning. So I think that there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of advantages um, to, you know, Americans or anyone else for that matter by by examining these these foreign jur jurisdictions um, for their you know personal or business purposes, and it's just really a matter of uh, consulting the right guidance and um, you know the right uh, the right advisors to make sure what's a good fit for you and, and really what is good for your term your your needs and, and your circumstances, but. Uh, you know, it's definitely not to be overlooked. And as long as you're in compliance and, and doing everything in the United States, there, there really shouldn't be any problem with, with taking advantage of these other countries. Fantastic. Well, Vincenzo, uh, give out your website one more time. Tell people where they can find you. Sure. So um, my website is it's onlinetaxman.com. Um, you could just uh, find it on onlinetaxman.com. You, uh, you could always feel free to, to write me an email directly. Uh, that's Vincenzo, V I N. C E N Z O at onlinetaxman.com, and uh, we'll be happy to help any of the listeners out there. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice.
Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.